continuing with the, uh, the, the tradition of the ASN webinar series, I'll be uh, trying to highlight uh, 10 important points. Yeah, so this would be the 10 points that I would be discussing. Uh, so I think um, I'll be spending a little bit more time talking about the second and the third points because I think that's important for us to understand. And then also I'll be spending more time discussing the fourth and the fifth points that's talking about the spectrum of the disease and particularly uh, describing uh, anti-NMDA encephalitis and also limbic encephalitis in detail. Uh, so this would be the other points that I would be uh, discussing. So to start off with, um, I think we, we, we did not know about uh, uh, autoimmune encephalitis about 15 years ago. So it was in 2005 that there was the first uh, description of antibody mediated encephalitis. But at that time, we, they did not actually specifically know what the antibodies were. But I think it was this seminal paper uh, into the 2017 from Joseph Dalamau and his colleagues uh, describing the anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis where they actually identified the receptor and after which we have seen a massive expansion of understanding and descriptions of patients suffering from this type of condition. So it actually completely changed our approach to patients who uh, present with encephalitis. So let's move on to understand the pathogenesis of this condition. So when we say autoimmune disorders in affecting the CNS, well, there are uh, uh, you know, different types of autoimmune disorders. So I think uh, if you look at, um, uh, let me go back again. Okay, uh, so if you look at the yellow circle, well, this is, you know, SLE is the best example that I can give. These are autoimmune diseases, but here CNS is affected just as one part of the multisystemic disease. But if you move on to the blue circle, these are purely nervous system problems, but these do not actually have an encephalitic component in these illnesses. So basically what we are describing today is this a uh, green circle, so which I have shown in an arrow, these are antibody mediated, they are pure nervous system problems, but most of them have a component of an encephalitis or an encephalopathy. So on that basis, let's look at what causes this encephalitis like illness and which are associated with antibodies. So the antibodies are of two different types and they are based on the location of action of the antibodies. So they could act on the cell surface or the synaptic protein. So they are called neuronal cell surface or synaptic antibodies, or their mechanism of action would be on intracellular components. So they are called intracellular antibodies. So these have differences in the pathogenesis and also they show differences in the clinical spectrum. And of course, there's a huge difference in their response to therapy. So let's look at the first group. That is the cell surface or synaptic protein uh, antibody disease. So what causes this? It seems to be that the pathogenesis is probably genetically determined. Uh, we are yet to uh, really understand what exactly causes this. So there seems to be a trigger and the trigger could be paraneoplastic or it could be para-infectious or maybe some unknown mechanism which triggers off your genetic potential to produce these antibodies. And these cause effect on the cell surface of the uh, neuron. And therefore, the degree of damage is often reversible. And of course, because these antibodies are on the surface and we can actually, our immune therapies can act on these antibodies and therefore the response to therapy is good. Now, when you look at the other group, that is the, uh, the intracellular uh, uh, antibodies, they are mainly related to paraneoplastic basis. So there is an underlying tumor and the main cell type which is activated in this intracellular antibodies is they cause damage through the cytotoxic T cells. So there is greater damage and the damage is caused on the whole cell itself and therefore there is irreversible damage in this condition. So you find this, uh, the patients are more affected and also return to normalcy is rather low in this group. And as I mentioned earlier, because of the intracellular nature of the antibodies, uh, the response to our routine immune therapy is poor. Okay, so 
let's look at this in a little bit more detail so that we are very clear about how the disease process takes place. So this is the first group. So I mentioned the genetic predisposition because there are many HLA types which have been described in these patients. So it seems that you have a trigger. So the trigger could be an infection like here, the commonest infection that they have described is herpes simplex encephalitis. So there are many infections which have been described or it could be a tumor. So exposure to these proteins triggers off your immune system and then uh, the antigen presenting cell activates the regional lymph nodes and that causes activation of plasma cells. So the main cell type that is affected in this group is plasma cells and they produce antibodies and cross the blood brain barrier. And here you can see its effect. So the effect is on the cell surface proteins or on proteins which are in the synaptic cleft. Now, if you look at the next type, that is the second type, uh, let's just move this out a little bit, okay. Uh, so you can see that the tumor uh, uh, releases this antigenic material which activates the immune system. But here the main cell type that is activated is the cytotoxic T cells. So the cytotoxic T cells obviously results in greater damage and then it acts on the cells which have these proteins, the intracellular proteins, and that would cause cell death. So that is the reason why we have irreversible damage in the second time. Okay, so moving on. Okay, uh, so let's try to understand the type of antibodies uh, uh, and then how it causes, you know, what are these antibody types? Because you'll be hearing different uh, types of antibodies being mentioned during this lecture. So I just thought that it would be nice to, you know, put a, a, a diagrammatic expression of what these antibodies and and where they would be acting. So the first group would be the intracellular antibodies and the commonest ones uh, that we know of our anti hue anti ma and anti gad antibodies. Uh, uh, before that, I need to mention that you know the list of antibodies is evolving over the years. Now this paper is from 2016, but if you take one of the more recent ones, you can see that the list is becoming longer. And in fact, they say that the description of new antibodies and new syndromes is occurring at a rate of one to two per year. So, but this is just, you know, to give a simplistic understanding uh, and to introduce a common antibodies to you. So these are the uh, uh, common intracellular antigens against which these antibodies are formed. So the second group would be uh, antibodies directed against synaptic receptors. So you can see the synaptic receptors here. Uh, so the antibodies, uh, the common ones, and the one that we would be discussing in detail today would be the NMDA receptor encephalitis. So the third group would be antibodies against ion channels um, or cell surface proteins. Uh, so the common one uh, and the one that I would be describing today would be LGI-1 antibody disease. Okay, so how do they cause effect? So the mechanism of action is really well known in the cell surface and synaptic membrane uh, antibody disease. Uh, we really, uh, we hyperscribe the mechanism in the intracellular antibody disease. So this is how it causes effect in the uh, um, uh, cell surface antibody disease. So it could either block the target antigens uh, like it is shown here. So there's an important antigen which is required for neuronal function. So it could be blocked and that causes disease or it could be causing uh, effect uh, on the cell surf, uh, synaptic uh, uh, receptors. So when the antibodies bind the receptors, they cause you know, cross-link and also that causes internalization so that there would be a, a reduction of uh, receptors and uh, for the normal function. Or it could be uh, the case of um, these proteins, these antibodies causing um, linkages with these proteins, which are important uh, for the normal function. So these protein proteins cause uh, uh, normally interaction. So there would be disruption of it by these antibodies binding to these proteins. So uh, that actually brings us to what would be the spectrum of disease. So spectrum of disease, uh, there are different ways of describing. So just to sort of, you know, make it clearer to people, you might wonder why one disease entity is called by the antibody and the other is called by a specific name. Uh, so it's just that, you know, in, in, in the clinical spectrum of disease, we find conditions which are either described based on the antibody. For example, the condition is called NMDA receptor encephalitis. Or you would find the case where it's described based on the clinical syndrome. For example, if you have 
it's an encephalitis and it affects the limbic system. So it's called limbic encephalitis, right? And, and we have this paradoxical situation uh, uh, when you talk about the spectrum of disease, in some conditions, one antibody only is responsible for that particular clinical uh, uh, syndrome. For example, NMDA receptor uh, encephalitis. So where it's the function of the NMDA receptors, which is dysfunctional. On the other hand, you may have the same disease caused by different antibodies, like limbic encephalitis being caused by different, different antibodies. And there is also this paradoxical situation where the same antibody can cause different syndromes as well. For example, GAD antibodies can cause limbic encephalitis and also it can also result in other different syndromes as well. So there is uh, this different ways of describing. But if you take uh, overall expression of what these diseases uh, present like, you could describe them as multi-stage diseases. So they present in multiple stages. But if you look at the beginning, in most of them, there seems to be a very subtle non-specific symptoms and there seem to be an overlap at the beginning. But beyond that, as the stages become established, you could clearly define that there can be two modes of presentation. You could have a febrile illness like with encephalitis-like presentation, or you could have mainly neuropsychiatric manifestations as the presenting feature. So your uh, uh, multi-stages become more established. And then you find that eventually most of these would have uh, effect on mood, behavior, memory, and of course, alteration of consciousness and seizures. And these would manifest in variable dominance depending on the clinical syndrome. And then within these, you also find specific clinical features which may then help you to identify this as a specific clinical syndrome. So where do we fit in? Well, it is our understanding and our ability to recognize these specific clinical features, which would help us to determine to which clinical syndrome these patients belong to. But overall, uh, it's uh, a multi-stage illness that we are dealing with. Okay, so let's try to understand the two most common uh, autoimmune encephalitis uh, uh, conditions. Uh, the commonest autoimmune encephalitis, anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, and this is the most widely described. And therefore, obviously, our understanding is greater about this uh, encephalitis. Uh, this tend to occur in the younger age. So basically occurring in less than 45 year olds. And within that also, it's more commoner in children and in young adults. And of course, it has the very, uh, very clear female, female predominance. So it's almost like four to one ratio of uh, increased presentation in the females. Who is the culprit? The culprit is actually antibodies against the NMDA receptor. And in that also against the GLUE N1 subunit of this receptor. So, what does it cause? Well, it would cause effects when, like what you would get if you have reduced NMDA receptor. So we know that NMDA is an important neurotransmitter, which is, uh, uh, it's, it is, is important for neuroplasticity, synaptic transmission, our memory, learning, human behavior. So the effects that we would see would be that when you get, when there is deficiency of NMDA receptors or reduce NMDA levels. So basically, it could affect your autonomic instability uh, because uh, uh, NMDA receptor is important for GABAergic activation. So in the absence of that, there is excitation. So that might end up in psychosis, keratonia, rigidity, dystonia. Then it also exerts effects on the brainstem regulator, which results in these abnormal movements that you get in this condition. And also because of the uh, uh, effect of these NMDA receptors on the respiratory network in the brainstem, it can also cause breathing dysfunction. So let's try and understand this multi-stage disease in a little uh, more detail. Uh, a few more facts about this, uh, about the tumor association. I said in NMDA receptor encephalitis is one of the uh, uh, um, synaptic uh, protein antibody disease. So the trigger could be, you know, could be tumor. Uh, it has been described in about 80 to 60%. It could be infection, 
or it could be vaccination or probably we really don't know what the trigger is. So the interesting association with teratomas was described like initially in the documentations, we thought it was mainly related to teratomas. But now we know that the association with teratomas is basically age dependent. So it's mostly in females who are older than 18 years and also it's more in black females. And therefore, we know that in, in the childhood uh, uh, group, particularly those who are less than 12 years, uh, the tumor association is extremely, extremely rare. So let's look at the symptoms. So I said it's a multi-stage disease. So this is the best example to understand this multi-stage nature of this autoimmune encephalitis. So in the y-axis, I have shown the deterioration in the uh, mental status, uh, how it goes down from baseline to coma. And on the x-axis, we have the time scale. So let's look at how the disease manifests in the pa patient. So initially you have this viral prodrome. So this actually often presents with a, like a fever and encephalitis like presentation in most instances. And this can then be followed by the second stage of neuropsychiatric symptoms. And in these neuropsychiatric symptoms also, they have very clearly defined that in the children, the presentation is different. They come with more neurological manifestations like seizures or speech abnormalities. Whereas in the older age group, they come more with the psychiatric symptoms like delusions, hallucinations, agit agitation, et cetera. So after this, this stage, then they move on to a, a further state. And that is also coupled with deterioration of your conscious status. And that's when you encounter the more problematic complications like your uh, breathing disorders where you may need ventilation and you have a very dominant spectrum of movement disorders. Now that becomes a very specific feature of this clinical syndrome. So you also would have this complication of dysautonomia and which often results in mortality. And then what do we see over time? So beyond these stages, then you see that there is a gradual recovery. So that recovery may take months to years and then you know, some may reach baseline, but then in, 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 in some, you may not actually come to the baseline and you may have deficits of variable degrees affecting mainly your cognitive functions and also speech disorders. Okay, so I've just shown some videos here just to highlight some of the movement disorders that we see in, in, in this uh, condition. So they are all children's videos because these are patients that we have had. And you would see their uh, movements are mainly around the perioral region or acral, right? So they would have dominant like coriform movements, uh, athetoid movements, sometimes maybe balismic movements, or the other dominant area is around the mouth. So they have different types of uh, abnormal movements uh, around the mouth region. Uh, so let's see whether we can see some more. Um, okay, so you can see uh, some abnormal movements in this video. Uh, and then uh, I would just like to mention this baby. Uh, she was actually 11 months when we saw. Uh, so just to point out the interesting association between herpes simplex encephalitis and uh, autoimmune encephalitis. So this baby had herpes simplex encephalitis and about two weeks later, then he presented with these abnormal movements and recurrent seizures. So picking on these abnormal movements becomes an important, you know, the specific clinical uh, feature that I mentioned, uh, which aids our clinical diagnosis. So how do they respond? Well, we, we are actually, uh, um, we are in a place where we can describe the outcome in this because this is the most studied and there are huge series like a 500 odd series, like 300 odd series of patients. So we understand the outcome of autoimmune encephalitis better than any of the autoimmune encephalitis. So usually uh, about 65 to 80% are shown to recover to baseline functions. And that is more in the pediatric age group where sometimes even up to 83% of baseline function or even 90% are described in some series. And also we in this group, we find that there is a large group who may just require only first line therapy. And if you have a tumor, they are shown to respond faster and those who with tumor have less relapses. And when they recover also, 
uh, we know that the recovery occurs in the reverse order of clinical symptoms, like for example, the ventilation and the dysautonomia corrects first, and then you have your movement disorder, then you have your psychiatric manifestations and so on and so forth. About 25% may relapse and mortality rate is generally low. Mortality rate would range up to about 4%. So then that brings me to the other, the second commonest group of autoimmune encephalitis, uh, and which is here, the description is based on the clinical spectrum. So it's called limbic encephalitis. And obviously you would can imagine that the dominant symptoms are affecting your limbic system. So therefore it has the classical triad of memory deficits, seizures, and psychiatric symptoms. And this has, a greater like older age group presentation. So mainly it's above the age of 45 years. And unlike NMDA receptor encephalitis, when I said, you know, it's just one antibody which causes the disease, here there are different antibodies which gives rise to the clinical spectrum of diseases. So which sex is uh, more affected uh, and the age groups would, would be determined based on the antibodies that are uh, uh, causing this disease. So let's quickly go through some of the investigations and some salient features you see in this condition. So the CSF would more often show pleocytosis in, in limbic encephalitis and the MRI in this condition becomes a very important tool to confirm the diagnosis because you would see these you know, very typical changes of T2 hyperintensities affect you know, your limbic system. So you would see the changes affecting the hippocampi. And here you can see even in the parahippocampal gyrus, where in the T2 flare images, you can see these hyper intensities. So if you look at the, um, the antibodies which cause this condition, so it can be different types which cause, it can be intracellular antibodies, and also it can be cell surface antibodies. So obviously the response to immune therapy would be very variable. So out of this group, there are, you know, I said different antibodies cause limbic encephalitis. The commonest antibody to cause limbic encephalitis would be LGI-1 antibody encephalitis. So I'll be speaking a few words about this because they are also very classical clinical presentations and also because of its commonality, there are more information available about uh, uh, LGI-1 antibody encephalitis. So here, it's more in the in 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 the greater like uh, uh, above 60 years age group and there's a very clear male dominance and this is one condition just like the nmda receptor encephalitis where you had movement disorder which is a very classical presentation and here you have a very specific clinical phenotype and which would aid your diagnosis even in the absence of antibodies so the the most uh, important clinical features would be the frequent seizures and the cognitive impairment. And out of these, I would like to take some time and describe this specific type of seizures that we see, which we call fasciobrachial dystonic seizures. And these are actually more or less diagnostic in this condition. Uh, so they also can have some uh, REM sleep behavior disorders. The uh, so fair percentage may have hyponatremia, uh, and also you can have some uh, paroxysmal dizzy spells. So, so if you see a 60-year-old who comes with uh, alteration of uh, you know memory dysfunction uh, and cognitive impairment, and if they have hyponatremia, you know think of this condition. You know just don't attribute it to hyponatremia itself. So when you look at the, uh, um, the underlying cause uh, here, unlike the other limbic encephalitis, the tumor association is rare. So they think it's more again, genetically. So uh, when they look at these patients, they have identified about 95% uh, to be associated with certain HLA types. So why some people are more likely to develop this seems to be more genetically determined. Okay, so let's have a look at what these fasciobrachial dystonic seizures look like. Okay, so I'll give you about 30 seconds to have a look at this. Remember fasciobrachial is face and the arm.
Yeah, so I think that's a good one. So I think, I hope you have seen now, there are about four or five. There's abnormal dystonic seizure affecting the corner of the mouth. And with that, you find a dystonic posturing of the upper limb as well. So in, in most, you have the face and the arm affected, but even the leg can be involved. These are very brief seizures and they occur multiple times a day. And the important thing is that, you know, this is very classical and also this is the presenting feature in about 80% of uh, patients. So if you detect this, if you recognize this, and if you think of AGI1 antibody encephalitis, well, that would help you to make the diagnosis even in the absence of antibodies. So how do these patients respond? Well, uh, let's take about the talk about the seizures. These particular type of seizures, well, they respond to immunotherapy, you know, much more than they do to uh, 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 anti-epileptic medications. And also, they have found that, you know, this is the presenting feature in most patients, uh, whereas uh, cognitive impairment may occur or may not occur in some, but if you treat the FBDs early, they have shown that you can prevent development of cognitive impairment because uh, those who develop cognitive impairment have been shown to have a poorer outcome. So therefore, if you delay immune therapy, if you miss this early presentation, they have shown that delay would result in a poorer outcome. Okay, so I think I mentioned the two main causes of autoimmune encephalitis, but the spectrum is wide. There are many syndromes which are described already. And as I mentioned, the number of syndromes which have been described every year is increasing the list. So what's important to know is they have common features. They are multi-stage diseases. They have an encephalopathy or encephalitis as part of the presentation, but specific clinical features would aid the diagnosis of the syndrome. And that would, you know, uh, you know, drive us to look for particular antibodies which are causing the illness and also to look for the underlying tumor because they have very specific associations. So I've just listed out some. I, I do not intend to go through this list because, but if I can just stress on a few. So, you know, each of them have very specific clinical features. For example, if you take Moan syndrome, they have neuromyotonia and also neuropathic pain. Uh, whereas in, in PERM or progressive encephalomyelitis with rigidity and myoclonus, so they have more spinal cord and CNS related presentation with, it's a very progressive uh, encephalomyelitis and they have rigidity and also frequent myoclonus as features. So if you take the encephalitis with DPPX antibodies, they have a dominant um, gastrointestinal presentation as the presenting symptoms, like for example, diarrhea or vomiting, and then they end up having encephalitis with seizures. Uh, if you have encephalitis against uh, GABA-A receptors, this is very classically associated with torrential seizures, they have lots of status and frequent seizures. So if you go through the list, they have specific clinical features. So it's just that, you know, being aware and thinking of this possibility when we look at these patients or when we manage patients with uh, encephalitis, that would aid you to uh, suspect these conditions. So that make, brings me to diagnosis, right? So we talk about antibodies, we know the list is widening. So does it mean to say that we need antibodies to make a diagnosis? I think this uh, uh, paper by Krauss et al. is a must read to everybody who is, you know, uh, treating patients with neurological conditions. And this paper very clearly, you know, has uh, helped the clinicians uh, to go through patients, even in the absence of antibodies. So the, the, the take home message from this paper was that antibody detection takes time. And we also know that, you know, even if it is the, uh, the clinical presentation is highly suggestive, we may not detect antibodies for several reasons. So what they showed was that there are distinct clinical features and they outlined diagnostic criteria, which would aid the clinician to make the diagnosis. So it could be at different levels of precision. You could make a diagnosis of possible AIE, or if you had more features, they outlined how you can make a diagnosis of probable AIE. And then they said, okay, with these features, you could make a definitive diagnosis of AIE, even in the absence of antibodies. So the best example would be, uh, you could diagnose limbic encephalitis if you had the features uh, with the MRI findings. And, and also, if you had specific features, you could make a diagnosis of definite autoimmune encephalitis 
and specific disease such as LGI-1 antibody uh, encephalitis. So it's a very useful uh, article uh, which can be recommended, highly recommended to be read by all. So uh, I, I'm going to rush through the rest of the slides because I've taken a lot of time, but then, uh, uh, so I'll be talking a, a few words about investigations. Uh, obviously they present like an encephalitis, so you will be doing basic investigations to rule out infection. So uh, uh, again, to reiterate on the important correlation with H, uh, herpes simplex um, encephalitis. Uh, so there is a strong association. There are many other infections which have been shown, mycoplasma, influenza, so on and so forth. So if you examine CSF, you might find uh, in a fair percentage to have mild to moderate lymphocytic pleocytosis. You may find CSF protein elevation, again, mild elevation, about one third, and some may have oligoclonal bands. EEG is almost always abnormal, but not very specific. So the abnormalities that you would have delta slowing, but the specific abnormality uh, can be found in some patients, about like 50 to 70% of patients who have NMDA receptor encephalitis, where they describe this um, uh, abnormality, which is called extreme delta brush, right? So there is delta slowing. You can see there is diffuse delta slowing. On some of these delta waveforms, you can see that there is a superimposed fast activity, uh, so which we call a, a brush-like activity. So uh, brush-like activity on the delta waveform is called delta brush. So delta brushes are normally seen in preterm babies, so it's like a marker of prematurity, you know, uh, you know, immature stage. Uh, in in uh, NMDA receptor encephalitis, what you get is continuous runs of these delta brushes, so it's called extreme delta brushes. So let's look at the role of uh, imaging. Well, imaging, the usefulness is variable. It depends on the type of autoimmune encephalitis. In some, you have florid changes. In some, you don't have changes. Uh, so percentage of uh, and abnormalities depend on the clinical condition. So in limbic encephalitis, it's fairly, you know, you would see this classical MRI changes, whereas in NMDA receptor encephalitis, it's very subtle and you may change, see changes only in about 30%. You see florid changes in, in GABA A receptor encephalitis. And also interestingly, you know, same MRI abnormality can be caused by different antibodies. So let's just, we'll have a look at a few of these. So here, NMDA receptor encephalitis, I mentioned it's very subtle abnormalities that you see, whereas in LGI-1 uh, uh, antibody disease, which causes limbic encephalitis, you can see this, you know, very specific change. If you have D2R um, receptor encephalitis, they have mainly um, uh, basal ganglia changes and here, florid changes in GABA A receptor encephalitis. And uh, so I've just put ADAM as well, just to compare. And also in, in some of them, you can have diffuse cortical MRI changes. So it's the role of uh, um, imaging should be taken together with the clinical condition. Let's talk about antibody detection. Uh, so uh, these are caused by antibodies. So uh, the definitive diagnosis would depend on establishment of the antibodies. And also it helps you to look for specific uh, tumors. Uh, and also it helps you in your prognostication, but it's actually not very easy to identify. So if you take overall detection rate of antibodies, probably about 50% of autoimmune encephalitis may not, we may not find the antibodies. There are different reasons why we do not find. Uh, you can look for the antibodies in serum and you can also look for antibodies in CSF. So if you take serum, it's not very sensitive. Uh, you know, for different reasons, you may not detect it in the serum. Uh, whereas in the CSF, in most of the autoimmune encephalitis, the CSF is definitely more sensitive and the chances of detection of antibodies is high. The only exception is LGI-1 antibody encephalitis, where CSF may not detect the antibody. You may detect it in the serum. So again, maybe uh, your clinical suspicion should you know, aid you to decide uh, whether you're going to do CSF or serum in suspected LGI-1 antibody disease. But if you ask me, OK, what would be the ideal? Ideal would be if you can do both CSF and serum. Well, we don't have resources, we have to make a choice. So in that situation, which one would you think of if you have, can only do one? Well, I think we would try to do in CSF. If you're thinking of LGI-1, it's best if you check in serum. 
But what is the most important message that I want to leave you behind is that you don't need antibody testing, you know, to consider the diagnosis. You know, I put it down in red. Antibody testing can never replace the clinical judgment. So it's your clinical judgment that is important because you may detect antibodies which are, you, you could find a person who has a tumor and he may have antibodies, but really not have clinical symptoms. That is possible. And they have also shown that you know, when you have herpes simplex encephalitis, you may not have the NMDA receptor encephalitis, but those antibodies can be present. So therefore, antibody testing is only, uh, uh, you know, supportive. It should never replace your clinical judgment. Right, so let's move on to tumor screening is also part of your investigation. So I will not go to a lot of detail on that. Uh, let's discuss treatment. Right. Okay. So when you talk of treatment, uh, it's uh, it's a management package. So you have immediate treatment, and also, of course, because it's a long-standing disease, it's a lot. There's a long-term management as well. When you talk of immediate management, there are three things important approaches we take. One thing is immune therapy because this is an immune-mediated disease. The second one is you try to remove the trigger. So that's in the case of tumor and never to forget the supportive care because that's what the killer is. So you have to support the seizures, the, uh, the need for intensive care, the respiratory problems, the movement disorders, mood problems, so on and so forth. So what is the best approach? Do we have a best approach or the ideal approach? Well, unfortunately, no, because we don't have clinical trials on this. So all what we have is guidelines, and these are based on uh, what is described in series of patients. So of course, in NMDA receptor encephalitis, there are a large series. So we are in a better wicket or better position to make recommendations. So up to now, what we have is what is based on large cohort studies and of course based on expert opinion. So let's look at the, the immediate treatment. So under immediate treatment, uh, you, you have immunotherapy and how you deliver immunotherapy is divided into first line immunotherapies. And then if you fail, you go on to second line immunotherapy. So as I mentioned, I would like to highlight on the red box first before I go to this. So again, to highlight there's, you know, no, this is the ideal, right? But we, we are getting more and more information. So more literature. So I've just quoted something which is more recent. And then I'll go through the uh, management. So obviously the first line immunotherapy. So important things are early immune therapy and hitting hard. So you obviously would go to higher doses of immunotherapy and even some centers advocate combining so that you hit hard. So again, it depends on how people practice in different uh, centers. But IV methylprednisolone high dose for five, five days is the standard first line immune therapy where we start off. It could be coupled with IVIG concurrently or maybe given afterwards. And as you can see, when you give IVIG, some people give for a shorter, you know, over a shorter duration, or whereas some people might take the four to five days. One advantage of, you know, giving it quicker would be that the, one of the first lines would be plasma exchange or immune absorption. So if you do plasma exchange immediately after giving IVIG, you know that you will be removing your treatment. So if you give IVIG earlier on, sometimes there might be a little bit of a gap before you come for the plasma exchange. So plasma exchange is recommended to be done over five to seven cycles, you know, every other day. So you would realize that this package would take about, you know, 14 days to complete. So most recommendations are that you, you know, you go through this and then if they have poor response and then you could move on to administer second line medications. So second line medications are two forms. You could give rituximab or cyclophosphamide. In some adults, they recommend using them together. So you use cyclophosphamide and rituximab at the same time. Uh, but in most pediatric cases, they recommend use of rituximab probably because of the safety profile. So you have the immediate immune therapy, and then of course you have to maintain the immune therapy because you know that it's something that has triggered on. So there'll be more antibodies which is produced. So second lines would include mycophilinated morphetil or uh, isothioprine. And in, in some of the more recent papers, you they even advocate this uh, third lines if you fail a second line, things like uh, tacilizumab and also use of low dose interleukins. 
So uh, that brings me to describe a few of the outcomes they have described. In uh, So I said we have more data with regard to NMDA receptor encephalitis. So this comes from a series of about 577 patients. So what they showed was that if you respond to first-line immune therapy, you would definitely have a better outcome. Uh, and also they showed that uh, if they failed first line and didn't receive second line, their modified ranking score is relatively low, whereas those who were given second lines would have a better outcome. So a few more information about outcome. This is overall, like, you know, all autoimmune encephalitis, how much you improve and the rate would depend on the type. For example, NMDA receptor encephalitis, response a bit slower than limbic encephalitis, but in NMDA receptor encephalitis, they may come to a, a, a greater proportion, come back to the baseline in comparison to limbic encephalitis where, you know, maybe a lesser percentage would reach the baseline. Overall, you could say that about 70% respond to escalation of immune therapies. And if you respond, if you need only first line medications, obviously your outcome is going to be better. So they do relapse. Relapses range between about 12 to 35 percent. But then how long do we need to give immune therapy? You know, there's no direct, you know, standard duration. Some guidelines recommend 12 months. Some recommend six months. So it's like, OK, you have to weigh with the clinical features of your patient. Uh, and of course, if you have a tumor and if you have received immune therapy, the relapses are less. We often tend to, you know, end at this. You know, one important thing we have to remember, the prognosis is not only based on what the outcome is for the immune therapies. It is also based on how much you rehabilitate these patients. So it's important to remember that there is a need for prolonged rehabilitation because eventually you may survive and motor function may recover, but they are often left with cognitive problems and fatigue and also language dysfunction. And they are often the last to recover. So they are not to be forgotten in our management of these patients. Okay, so last, the future. <laughs> So I think you can see what I'm trying to get at. We only know about the tip here. There's so much more to be understood. So we need a lot of understanding and probably, you know, this is an evolving entity. So we need greater understanding of the pathogenic mechanisms and that would aid us to think of better treatment options, which is beyond immunotherapies and also try and identify biomarkers. That's the most important thing and which would facilitate early treatment and accelerate recovery. And also remember, these are autoimmune disorders. So you have a, a, a lot of overlap within these uh, uh, clinical spectrums. So these are the points that I would like to leave behind with. I did not put the 10 points again. I think I covered the 10 points. I'm sorry, I know I have taken a little bit of extra time, but I wanted to emphasize on how the pathogenesis of these conditions occur and highlight that we are understanding and it's evolving, our understanding is evolving. And we need to recognize that there are specific clinical syndromes. So we need to be aware of them and we need to be able to recognize them because if we recognize them and then you know that aids a quicker diagnosis and we can deliver a, a quicker therapy to these patients. Uh, and also certain types have a better outcome and needless to say, early treatment is crucial. And how best it is to be treated, well, we really don't know. We are under, I think our understanding is improving as more and more uh, series are being described. And, and we can look forward to uh, uh, descriptions of different treatment modalities in the future. So I'd like to end at that. <laughs>